Good afternoon and welcome back everyone. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Green Mountain Care Board, and I'll call our meeting back to order. And uh, the first item will be an, an Executive Director's Report, Susan Barrett. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. First, I want to announce some agenda changes. Uh, we we had um, the first part of the meeting this morning where I announced these uh, changes, but I want to reiterate them. Um, first, for this afternoon's agenda, we have listed um, the wait time metrics for hospital budget guidance. We, we took that agenda item earlier today. And then there is a the item number three on today's agenda, which is the Department of Mental Health update. Um, we heard late yesterday from the Department of Mental Health that they were unable to um, attend in person to our me meeting today. They did submit a written memo, which we've posted to our website for, for those who wish to look at that. And I do believe we'll... Um, after we hear from the University of Vermont Medical Center uh, psych psychiatric inpatient update, uh, we will hear from, uh, we will talk um, with the board about their comments. So I just wanted to um, clarify that agenda item. I also just want to remind folks that we have two public comments ongoing, the all pair model next agreement public comment um, we're accepting any comments regarding a potential next agreement with the federal government. We share all of those comments with our partners at AHS and the governor's office as they are leading the negotiations on the next potential model. And then the second comment is regarding the essential health benefits plan update. And there is a link on our public comment uh, page that directs folks to the Department of Financial Regulation page where they are collecting comments on that new proposed plan. So that is all I have to report. I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Susan. So let's get right into the discussion at hand today, which was is the University of Vermont Medical Center um, Psychiatric Inpatient Capacity uh, Report. And I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Brumstead and uh, Eve. I'm, not, Eve, sure I'm not sure who's leading it, but whichever one of you oh. is. <laughs> I'll, I'll start off, Mr. Chair. Good good afternoon, everybody. And I hate to start with a, a correction, but this is a University of Vermont Health Network um, uh, uh, plan, and the work has been done uh, with lots of UVM Health Network uh, uh, hands uh, hands on. So um, it clearly is not UVM Medical Center. And so, in a regulatory hearing like this, let's make sure that we keep that uh, pretty clear. Um, uh, we're here to. Um, uh, give an update on the psychiatric inpatient capacity project that we started uh, in earnest um, just about four years ago uh, uh, exactly uh, now uh, in 2018. Obviously a much different time. I would look back and say it was bucolic in uh, relation to where we are and, and where we've been. Um, we've been uh, giving quarterly reports uh, on this project, quarterly updates uh, in writing, and a couple of times we've given uh, testimony. And what we're doing today is an update. So that I may refer to some things that have been presented before and not go into uh, great detail. I do want to thank Chair Mullen for um, uh, giving us uh, uh, a, uh, a couple of extra weeks. Um, we're having some difficulty with the slide projection. Um, uh, we want just the uh, the main slide on. So, um, pardon while we get our technical act together. And we can always help to project them, um, Chair Mullen. But we'll stand by. I'm sure Kara can help with that. And, and duly noted on the agenda, we are going to uh, change that listing. Thank you for pointing that out, Dr. Thank Brunson. You. No problem. So can somebody speak to the uh, um, fact that we have uh, PowerPoint in construction uh, on, the, on the viewer here?
Anya, are you driving the uh, PowerPoint? She's, um, uh, she and others are, are trying. I just, I don't know why we've got uh, got this going on. My We're apologies. Working on it. It, it looks right from here, but I'm, uh, I understand you're seeing something different. Okay, well. Uh, are you all seeing something different? Eve, are you seeing something different? You see the title slide? Don, I'm seeing what you're seeing. No, we're 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 seeing the presenter view. I've, I've been here before. I can't give you any technical advice. I think Susan's smiling. Okay, uh, Natalie's working on it. I think if give you it. want to go to presentation view, and what you're seeing is two slides simultane simultaneously. Well, with you your did, notes, I guess. You did trust us to notes. build a $200 million um, uh, uh, Miller building. Thank you very much. Uh, we're better at that. Um, uh, two more seconds, and then please send it to, um, there you go. That's good. Um, it's fine to have the stuff on the side. Let's just keep it there. Is that OK? Can we go to the next slide? There we go. So this is what we're going to talk about uh, today, the need for the psych inpatient capacity, uh, uh, affectionately known as the PIC project uh, by us. And uh, we're not going to dive deep into the analysis of the need that's been done, uh, I believe, exquisitely well uh, over time. And I'll show you some data in a minute that uh, the need hasn't changed. Um, then going to turn to Eve, uh, who's going to show you that uh, we've uh, we've done what we wanted to do at this point, which is to design a facility. And we have some updates on uh, uh, what it costs in today's world to, to build that. And then I'm going to come back and meld together our current uh, network financial reality, which you all are uh, uh, deeply uh, uh, aware of. And then how the two come together, the implications of where we are with the project and our financial health. Next slide. So um, uh, the case for the need for more in, inpatient uh, beds, um, really from the analysis that we've done, uh, hasn't changed. And again, Eve will go through at a very high level uh, where that uh, rests right now. Um, go to the next slide, and this shows that that need um, uh, hasn't, uh, hasn't changed. That'll come in a minute. This um, is to indicate, and this is a DMH slide, that um, the PIC project really is to address one piece of the uh, access issues that um, uh, folks with mental health illnesses in Vermont have. We're just looking at the um, inpatient site capacity largely that was cut in half when uh, Irene took out the uh, state hospital in Waterbury. And um, so focused project, one piece. We know that there's a lot of other aspects to access for mental health services. Um, and um, uh, I used the metaphor right from the very beginning that we had a log jam. And the log jam was around the um, inpatient psych needs uh, of patients boarding in emergency rooms around Vermont. That was the real driver back in 18 to try and address this piece of the problem. And the log jam was if we pull out one log in the log jam, that being capacity for uh, inpatient, uh, uh, adult inpatient psychiatric uh, needs, that perhaps the whole uh, river would start uh, flowing much, uh, much better. And we still hold to that. But this is really one aspect of we know a much broader issue. Next slide. 
So these are the recent data that are brought forward, and Vaz has been doing a, a good job of this. This is the hospital emergency departments, uh, and these are patients waiting for inpatient care. That lower blue line are those that are fortunate enough to wait less than 24 hours. The orange line in the middle are those that uh, are waiting um, uh, over 24 hours and some days and we've even notched some poor folks that have been there for weeks. And you've heard from many, many different constituencies, including ED docs, psychiatrists, others. This is not the right way to treat these folks. It's not the right site of care. Um, it's largely not therapeutic. And it has uh, ramifications for others seeking um, uh, care in our emergency departments for emergent needs. So this issue this initial um, uh, rationale for launching this particular project uh, still exists and next slide and that's on a backdrop of overall increasing uh, urgent uh, needs and presentations by folks with mental health issues so this is the uvm medical center so it is the medical center the academic medical center emergency room visits uh, for uh, psychiatric diagnoses and other than the uh, uh, brief dip went in 2020 when uh, people just weren't coming to the emergency room because of COVID. This is inexorably climbed. And so this is sort of uh, a denominator of, if you will, of the need of the population. Tons written about this, uh, um, uh, probably related significantly to COVID, but also pre-COVID, these demands uh, were growing. So next slide. So I'm really proud of the fact that uh, we, as a uh, component of the healthcare delivery system for Vermont and Northern New York, uh, have not ignored this population. Um, we've actually focused on those with uh, uh, mental health needs um, uh, and uh, tried to weave that into everything uh, that we do to meet our mission. So we've increased inpatient beds even before the pandemic. Um, we staff VPCH uh, uh, with our psychiatrists and professionals. Um, We've developed some very innovative plans for integrating mental health care into all of our primary care sites, and we actually have implemented it. And this is a unique program in that it's not just putting somebody with mental health clinical skills in a site. This is truly integrating psychiatrists and others uh, with mental health uh, clinical skills into the care team in all of our primary care offices. So it's a unique model. Um, um, and But for workforce issues, this would be fully implemented. We've, we've had um, this um, largely in, uh, implemented, lost some uh, professionals. So we're uh, uh, in the middle of, of that, but that's uh, something that we've really focused on. Um, We've created dedicated spaces at Central Vermont and the medical center uh, in the emergency room for uh, folks with uh, mental health uh, issues and psychiatric diagnoses, um, but that still is not a therapeutic environment. We all know that it's um, more humane than just being in an ED uh, bed and it's better for other patients needing the ED as well, but it, it certainly doesn't uh, cure the issue. And and um, we've made increased investments in folks to sit with people with mental health illnesses. And the medical center estimate is uh, north of a million bucks a year in expense just for people to help keep these folks safe. They don't add anything to the therapy. They're just there if there's a problem to get somebody to come and help. During the pandemic, we've done everything we can to keep those uh, um, uh, things going. Um, and we've hired travelers to maintain, and in the case of Central Vermont, actually expand uh, inpatient capacity. And this is in uh, distinction with the Brattleboro Retreat and BPCH, which were unable to keep the beds open because of staffing issues. We've really um, 
pushed in this realm and in others to make sure during the the pandemic that we've kept that uh, capacity. And uh, therein lies uh, one significant factor in uh, uh, our financial situation currently. So next slide. So why did we commit to take on uh, this project in the realm of uh, academic uh, uh, health care and academic integrated delivery systems. This is not a type of project that traditionally would uh, rise to the top. Um, we, uh, me and our management team and our clinical teams, um, really uh, believe that this is uh, an important population uh, to care for. It's our mission as a not-for-profit healthcare organization to improve the health of everybody in the communities we serve. And we know that those with mental health diagnoses are vulnerable and traditionally underserved um, by both public and private payers. And we all know in the fee-for-service world, if it's undervalued by payers, the capacity is going to not be there to really meet the needs of the population. It's one of the uh, um, uh, consequences of that, that system. As I mentioned before, we know since uh, 2011, Vermont has had a deficit of inpatient psychiatric beds. Uh, I forget 52 or 53 uh, beds in the capacity in the uh, um, Waterbury um, uh, Hospital and uh, VPCH uh, rebuilt uh, roughly half of those. Um, so we've had this deficit, and we still have again the specific need that we were trying to address and still are trying to address to reduce uh, psychiatric borders in emergency departments around the state. So next slide. So uh, sad truth uh, in Vermont, this is just documentation that psych services are under valued and there's no solace in the fact that we're not alone in Vermont. You could uh, put virtually any state in there, but we've got these data for for Vermont. And this is specific to Center Vermont in 21 and its uh, facility uh, cost coverage. Medicaid, approximately 20 21% of cost. Commercial payers, um, uh, about 58% of cost. Uh, Medicare, uh, 38 percent of cost. So in our world, what we would do with this necessary service, and later in the presentation, I'll give you some more numbers, we would take revenue from other services to flow over and cover this deficit and end up at the end of the day still with that 3% plus or minus margin. As those um, revenues used to cover these types of services that are this far underwater dries up, the ability to cover what's in our current service mix and expense base is incredibly difficult and adding to that um, uh, the difficulties of is orders of magnitude uh, greater. So next slide. So I'm really proud of this this work too. Um, incredibly collaborative. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Eve, who's our uh, Eve Hoare, who's our vice president for strategic uh, planning. Does uh, our business work has a, a great crew that uh, uh, you've heard uh, from before, and you've seen again some of their work product specific to this product project on uh, uh, in uh, our written reports, and I believe in 2020, Eve, you and Anna, uh, maybe others uh, presented uh, some of the uh, where we were with this project. But I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, John. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we could go to the next slide. That would be great. Um, we're going to touch on um, some of the following things. Um, we'll give you a quick update or just do a quick highlight of the work and our needs analysis and some of the facility design. You've heard that before. You've seen it in um, many of the quarterly reports that we've um, filed. 
and then share with you um, the more recent um, results around the project cost and the operating um, financial pro forma. Before we move on to the next slide, though, let's take a minute and talk about stakeholder engagement. Um, it was huge for this project. Um, we we invited um, patients, pa individuals with lived experience, um, some patients, former patients, um, uh, representatives from the designated agencies, other other colleagues um, from state agencies and our and our hospital colleagues, um, to really lend us their expertise and advice um, at all the phases of of this project. And we're enormously grateful to them. And this this project design is far better for all of their contributions. So um, thanks to everyone for their time. And I'll also call out the PIPS group. You all know that we met with them on a regular basis um, to share our progress and the results of our work. And we remain very indebted to those um, individuals as well. Okay, and now we can go on. Let's jump right into the needs analysis. Thank you. So there were two big components of the needs analysis. The first component was that bed demand model that tried to forecast the number of additional adult, adult psychiatric inpatient beds that we would need by 2028. And if you remember, we had a little equation and um, that resulted in a range of somewhere between 29 and 35 beds that we would need. The second component of that needs analysis went and did an assessment of the IMD statute, the Institute for Mental Disease statute. And that statute says um, that there's a limit to the number of inpatient psychiatric beds that you can have for an adult population without jeopardizing federal um, reimbursement for all of your patient population. So after that careful work, um, the conclusion was very clear that CVMC couldn't accommodate more than 40 inpatient adult psychiatric beds on their campus without jeopardizing um, that, um, that federal payment. Um, so we had our direction, we had need, we had the IMD assessment, and we um, proposed that we build a 40 bed um, adult inpatient psychiatry unit. A quick note, so as time passed on, um, we looked at our bed need model and said, okay, things have changed. Let's go back to um, more recent data and make sure that the need for those additional beds, um, again, forecast out to 2028, didn't drop below 25 so that we weren't overbuilding. And every time we looked at that same kind of tip of the iceberg of those emergency department visits, those long-term stay, those long-stay patients, um, what we found was um, that in, 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 in all cases, the number of those patients was just increasing over time. So we felt pretty sure that, um, we felt very sure actually, that that 25 beds um, was, uh, was the right number um, to build. Next slide, please. Um, we wanted to give you a feel as we think about now um, the design phase of this uh, facility. Here's just a, one slide on the number of different types of rules that get involved in a facility plan. Um, really clear at the top, again, I'll just underscore our peer advocates, our individuals with lived experience, our patient and family advisor were absolutely instrumental. We thank them so much for their time. Their changes, Eileen He, who, who led the facility as part of this project for CVMC, um, just couldn't say enough about the large and many small ways that the contributions um, of, of these folks contributed um, to the work that was done. Um, but as you can see, uh, a lot of input from a lot of key players in actually making this um, facility and the patient experience and the clinical experience work for everybody um, involved there. We can go on to the next slide. Thanks. Um, our program design phase was um, once we had the, the number of, of beds for the unit down, we went to program design phase. You might recall this was facilitated by um, our longstanding facilities partner, HALSA Advisors. They did a masterful job of kind of convening these groups and talking about 
what a, care, a therapeutic care environment that was safe for patients and safe for staff. Um, what did that look like? How would it operate? What did it feel like? And then how many staff would we need to, to make that happen? Um, we actually thought about, um, and we did actually propose that, for example, support staff who might be delivering laundry um, or delivering pharmaceuticals, medications coming in, um, didn't actually go in the same hallways, but they had kind of an interior pathway so that we wouldn't disturb patients who were um, were in their own um, environments. and. Um, and so we really, there was a lot of great thought um, to, to that happening. And the final outcome of the program design was um, for the space plan. And we kind of replicated this approach, not only for the inpatient psych units, but for the intake unit in the ED, um, and also for those supporting departments, so that we made sure that we kind of looked at all the aspects of, of what care um, for this population of patients um, might look like from the minute they arrived at CVMC. Next slide, thank you very much. Um, so just to recap, the, the scope of the facility is um, a 40-bed adult inpatient psychiatric unit that's actually divided up into three tiers, um, tier one being highest acuity, 16 tier, tier two beds, and 16 tier three beds. All of the rooms in these units are single occupancy with their own private bathrooms and showers. Um, and the other really important thing about this unit is um, the rooms are bigger. They're meant to be able to accommodate patients who have an accompanying medical condition if needed. And that's not the case in every um, psychiatric hospital that, that you go to. Um, there were places to store their personal belongings. Again, a lot, of, a lot of care given to the patient room space and also to the group spaces, group therapy rooms, exercise rooms, access to outdoor, um, outdoor spaces um, and outdoor uh, natural light and views as well as part of that therapeutic environment. On the ED, um, what, we, what we learned about the flow of patients when they arrived at CVMC and up to the inpatient psychiatric unit was we needed that ED to, be, ED to be close. And so this facility has them, you'll see it on the next slide, actually stacked one on top of the other. Um, but the ED had an intake unit, and then we had an expansion of the current um, CVMC ED to accommodate more emergent psychiatric cases, because that's what we're seeing. Um, in particular, a better way to accommodate the needs of pediatric um, patients who are coming to our EDs with emergent mental health conditions and need some private safe space. So we did, um, we, we really improved the situation to provide care to those younger patients. Um, and we also gave our staff much better room and space in accordance with kind of uh, the modern standards for support care um, to do their jobs more efficiently and take care of their patients better. Um, lastly, it was absolutely critical that we connect this facility to the uh, CVMC main building to allow the efficient um, ability to support um, these units from nutrition services, environmental services, security, pharmacy, so that those things that are functioning for the rest of CVMC can easily kind of just glide right over and support the inpatient um, psychiatry units as well. Next slide. So there you go. In that, we tried to cram two things in one slide here. In the top right, you'll see a schematic of the facility. So the ED goes on the, and there's our little color block of the floors, if you will. ED on the ground floor, um, the, the two inpatient psychiatric uh, floors above that, and then a fourth floor that has a little bit of psych admin space and then the building mechanicals um, as well on that floor. But you can see lots of access to natural light. You can't see the rooftop gardens on, on, this, um, uh, on this thing, but, they 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 are definitely there and we're on the we're on the floor plans. On to the site. Wow. Uh, when I first came to CVMC, uh, I thought in comparison to UVMMC, where it feels like a New England farmhouse, that CVMC has its own challenges. 
And um, between a ravine and back, high intensity power wires, roads on two sides, you, those of you who know CVMC know exactly what I'm talking about. It became very difficult to find a place for a facility of this size and bump it up right against um, the main campus. But we found one. It's right there in that parking lot. For those of you who come into CVMC from Fisher Road, it's right there on the right as you come in. So you can see it in that dark orange spot. Um, that that's where the facility um, will be. Fantastic for ambulances coming to RED, but, um, but challenging um, as we think about what happens to the rest of the campus. So we've expanded parking to deal with the displaced parking spots um, where the facility will be, as well as additional parking that we need for staff and visitors for our patients. So there you can see the expanded parking there to the north-ish. And then we had to go expand some more parking um, down to the south um, across Fisher Road. Okay, that's the quick recap. Let's go on to the next slide, please. All right, now on to the project's capital costs. Let's go to the next slide. Thank you. All right, so in 2020, um, we completed um, an early phase of facility planning called conceptual design. That's when we have the square footage um, for the plan of the building. We find the appropriate benchmarks. We do the math. We have some early estimates on some key parts. Um, and this came out of the oven um, in very early 2020 um, with a price tag of $148 million on it. And at that time, so this this this, this phase of the design in some ways did exactly what, what it was supposed to do, which is to say, if that's your plan, here's your rough estimate of the cost. And our steering committee said, that cost is too high. You need to go back to the drawing board and do a lot of value engineering. And that is what we did. We shared this um, information with you in, I think it was the 2020 February quarterly report. Um, so we went back to work. We started with some value engineering um, that happened, I believe in, Anna, you can keep me straight here, uh, February, March, and maybe, yeah, I'll say February and March of 2020. And then we had to pause that work because COVID arrived. And honestly, we couldn't have partners on our sites to help confirm or validate any of the ideas we had um, for value engineering. We were just working with our partners virtually um, at that point. Um, so um, when summer of 2021 came, we brought our partners back on campus. We had our value engineering plan. We could really validate uh, many of the ideas um, that we had. And we did find that we were able to eliminate things like the parking garage that we thought um, we thought we could fit into the budget, which we, you know, we couldn't. Um, there was a two-story hospital connector. We scratched that from the project. Um, we thought we could save a lot of money by, um, by creating um, some standalone mechanical systems for this facility because it was of the right size. And we did, we achieved some savings, but we didn't achieve as much as we thought, to be honest with you. We also added some things. For example, we learned from the pandemic and our experience with, um, with our own um, psychiatry units at UVMMC and at CVMC that we needed to create more negative pressure spaces um, so, that, um, so that we could, not have to close beds um, when we had our next pandemic or you know infectious disease outbreak. I think, unfortunately, we all re realize that this is likely to be part of our future. Um, so there were some things like that. But by far, and as you know, the biggest thing that happened to us was um, inflation. So number one, we were going with real estimates. We had an itemized list, no more square foot and estimates by square foot. It was itemized list of exactly what we needed in each one of these units. The list is really huge. Um, but the impact of inflation on every single one of those estimates was real and big. And it brought our total back up to $158 million. Um, Dave Kilty showed me a graph of the cost of steel um, increase, um, and it's the the slope of the line is is just crazy. But you, you all have your own stories about that. Let's go to the next slide, if we could. Um, so um, 
So our capital cost estimate, um, as I mentioned, is 157.8 million. Here's a quick breakdown: 121 million for facilities, about 18 um, and a half million for equipment, some IT. Um, those other expenses include um, fees um, for permitting for architects and designers and other partners, and um, some other miscellaneous things. I asked a group if we could um, allocate that capital cost to the inpatient psych units and to the ED separately. And so um, per that allocation methodology, um, it's about 100 million of that 158 million for the inpatient psych units and about 57 million uh, related to the, um, the, to the new ED. We can go on to the next slide. Thank you. So now on to the um, the pro forma operating financials. Um, I'll give you the bottom line first when I want to go back and talk about the work we did to model the revenue and the expense side. So what we concluded was that operating this inpatient psych 40 bed inpatient psychiatry unit would add another $25 million in annual operating loss to the CVMC financials. Um, the, um, our estimated contribution margin is actually a negative uh, $29.7 million. Um, so we, um, I want to talk a little bit about the work that we did actually back starting in 2020 on both the revenue and expense side for just a quick sec. Um, so we convened a reimbursement group um, with lots of folks from inside the network and from outside the network. Um, and we're grateful, um, several folks from the state, some representatives from Vaz um, and other places, but we wanted to build a reimbursement model that we thought was fair and accurate. Um, and so we're indebted to those colleagues um, out there who helped us um, to actually build that, um, that reimbursement model. On the expense side, we were really careful. So staffing, as you can imagine, is a big factor on the expense side. We were careful to reach out to our colleagues at VPCH, at Rutland, um, to benchmark um, staffing per um, to patient ratios. And so got a lot of feedback on that, lots of, lots of iterations on that. But as we all know, we're, um, our expenses are being driven by increased staffing costs. Um, we also updated um, the percentage of travelers that um, assumptions that were in the original model um, to be more in line with, um, with what we're experiencing currently. Um, and so this does reflect about this expense reflects about seven million dollars in premium pay. So that's pay above what um, we expect to we expect to pay permanent staff um, for travelers um, to to share that. Um, so that was a very um, it was very sobering. I think you have to get the idea that we checked and double checked our numbers, but um, but this all gave us pause. Um, John, let me turn it back to you. Technical difficulties today. I had to find the mute button. <clears throat> so um, um, project gets to that point, and something that we've talked about all along is um, engaging with payers to make sure that we can have a reimbursement model that will um, uh, that will at least allow us to break even. And I will say that uh, our work with Secretary Samuelson and with uh, the Department of Mental Health and their leadership and staff has been great, been very engaging. And in the January, I think December, January, and maybe even into February timeframe, we had folks meeting together, sharing in much greater detail the pro forma and uh, the cost side. And for the Medicaid program, which of course is a significant part of the uh, payer mix for a unit like this, but not the only payer, um, there was conceptual agreement that uh, we would try and get to break even payments, but it's very clear that 
there is risk in that because you have to go through a legislative process uh, and appropriations to actually uh, have those those payments made. Um, and so um, uh, at that point, we need to step back and assess the afford affordability of uh, this and all other major capital projects. So this is back to um, uh, where we are in trying to uh, uh, take all of the incoming information that we have on the revenues that we can expect, our current expense structure, our service mix, and try somehow to get to a FY23 budget that gets us back at the UVM Health Network on a solvency path because we're not on one uh, now. And so this presentation fine to give it, but it's a little bit out of context because we're going through all of our capital projects, not just this one, in our current financial situation. And we're going through um, uh, uh, our programs and our service mix uh, as well. Um, um, again, trying to get to a place um, where we can uh, craft a achievable uh, and uh, uh, budget for 23 that puts us on a sustainable uh, course. But I don't want to look past the fact that Secretary Samuelson and her team have been engaged and have been very willing to listen, learn, um, uh, kick the tires of what we put on the table um, uh, and to uh, 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 try to help. So next, next. So this um, is where our financial situation and the projects start coming together. Um, um, the uh, current um, carrying uh, load from a financial perspective for UVM Health Network for inpatient psychiatry is that we lose 13 million a year. And again, in um, sort of stayed usual times, there are revenues from other services that we provide that we can take and we can use to cover these sorts of uh, services uh, that are part of our service mix. As those revenues have dried up, it's created incredibly difficult uh, decisions for our clinical and administrative management team on what and how we cover those services. And as I said before, it makes adding incremental services, um, uh, I won't say impossible, but orders of magnitude more difficult than even trying to figure out how we're going to cover uh, what we have. When you add in what uh, Eve gave us on the pro forma uh, for inpatient psychiatric care, um, uh, we would be looking at um, uh, covering uh, 25 million in uh, expense over uh, uh, patient care uh, revenues uh, for this uh, for this project. So next, um, I'm not going to. Uh, uh, beat this uh, too soundly. You've got uh, plenty of this a couple of weeks ago, but um, we have uh, thin or negative margins since uh, 2018. So we really don't have the uh, financial resilience that uh, uh, most um, uh, academic integrated systems have. And I've actually fielded the question from our folks as I've um, been talking about the rigors of creating a uh, budget for 23 and the tough choices that uh, we need to make. And they say, John, you know, are we, why are we doing this? Are we different than other organizations? And other organizations like us have had really, really tough, particularly uh, late calendar uh, 21 and into January, February, March of uh, 22. We've got data from Kaufman Hall and others that showed that um, not-for-profit, particularly academic health care, has uh, taken it on the chin. What I tell our folks is that on a backdrop of good, solid financial metrics and bedrock, you can weather that and come out relatively quickly. Our difference is, and I'll show you some uh, graphs, uh, I promise I won't beat it too hard uh, in a couple of minutes. Um, 
We've had expense uh, inflation not covered by allowed revenue. We do have our age of plan um, increasing, which uh, is a tough place uh, to be. Uh, folks have, uh, when we talked about mid-year rate increases, were clamoring uh, around uh, uh, for us to use our reserves. Well, um, we've gone down almost a month in uh, uh, days cash since the beginning of the fiscal year. Um, and this is clearly not sustainable and should worry all of us. Um, and we've got significant workforce shortages, 50% uh, vacancy rate. Um, uh, we usually chug along at about seven to 800 open roles uh, in our whole network. That's, we've got about 15,500 um, uh, great folks that work for us in uh, all of our uh, organizations. So we bumped up to about 2,000 open roles. And even though we're filling those at a greatly accelerated uh, rate, um, uh, it's uh, really being on, uh, on a hamster wheel here. Uh, it's tough to, to get ahead of that. So these are really significant stressors, which are the backdrop not only of this conversation, but of uh, how we're trying to put together the uh, uh, 23 budget and, and how we're looking at all of our proposed uh, capital projects. Next. This is presented uh, a, a slide that was put together by uh, your staff uh, a couple of weeks ago. Note that uh, 21 uh, really bumps up, but that's all one-time money. And we all know the difference between one-time money and uh, money that is in the uh, run rate or expense that's uh, in the uh, in the run rate. And so those are federal the federal dollars that that came in. And it's important to uh, uh, stratify that and pull out center Vermont um, in this context any depreciation on that building and really the operating uh, uh, losses or expenses need to be on the books of center Vermont because um, that's current regulatory structure anytime you want to go to uh, uh, managing and regulating our budgets as one large network um, uh, we're there with you but uh, that doesn't work right now so uh, Central Vermont uh, pulled out um, is uh, I think it was characterized as a sea of red um, on to the next slide so I'll show you a few graphs and this is work that um, uh, we've done uh, because we're going to be out uh, talking to lots of folks about our financial situation just to help them understand uh, where we're uh, coming from uh, as far as any uh, changes uh, in our uh, service mix or uh, our capacity. And you'll see a couple of slides, very simple, be quick. Um, slides have two lines that I'll point out. One is a financial sustainability threshold. You're above that, everything's hunky-dory and ducky, you stay there. And there's a second line, financial sustainability at risk. Um, and no news to you, you guys are all over um, the sustainability stuff. This is just putting in relatively simple, digestible graphic terms, some parameters on that. And these parameters come from uh, standard industry met metrics, uh, uh, largely from rating agencies. Next slide. So um, just look at the operating margin in these slides include some straightforward, digestible, understandable um, uh, definitions for these things. But the green line, just look at the uh, graph on the left, operating margin. Green line is the uh, uh, financial sustainability threshold. You're chugging around that. Everything's great. You keep going. And we've been in the at the network level, the 3% range. And uh, these are... Um, just the UVM Health Network Vermont affiliates, and it's just Porter Hospital. It doesn't have the nursing home because that's the way uh, you look at it. So this doesn't include the New York affiliates. Um, uh, trust me, they don't make it look any rosier. Um, the orange line is the financial uh, sustainability risk threshold. If you're consistently below that on any of these graphs, uh, danger, 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 and really, again, we all should be uh, concerned uh, about that. And you can see since 20, uh, 
uh, 18 operating margin and uh, the real uh, issue for us, particularly as it pertains to capital projects, the EBITDA margin um, has um, not only been under that sustainability, but uh, for uh, going on five years now. And that, um, if it doesn't correct, which is why I'm being uh, so hard on our folks on the 23 budget, if that doesn't correct, um, uh, then... Um, uh, all sorts of terrible things happen to um, to these these organizations that are part of the UVM Health Network. Next slide. Uh, on the left, age of plant uh, again, um, deferred maintenance and um, uh, equipment needs, and uh, we're really uh, for the second year, 21 and 22, our ca capital spend is break fix only and uh, break fix specific to um, uh, things that uh, are primarily directly patient facing. Obviously, if it's a boiler or something like that, uh, you can't deliver care if it's uh, below zero, but um, we're on break fix. We're not spending capital on anything. Days cash on hand, uh, again, really troubling below that, um, uh, that threshold, um, uh, the risk threshold. And again, from uh, end of 21 to uh, the end of March, uh, we've burned 28 days of cash uh, just to keep things going. Not good, not good. So how all of this comes together, um, the original plan, as you're well aware, uh, was to put in a certificate of need for this project with some significant caveats. Um, uh, we can't do that. Go to the next slide. When we put a certificate of need in, um, really the first thing we do very much at the beginning is, is there a need? Yes, there is. Um, do we meet the criteria to need a CON? If yes, do we have the ability to meet and exceed those criteria? Because we don't put CONs in that um, uh, are going to uh, not be uh, approved. You can't go back then for a set amount of time, and it's it's all sorts of uh, uh, work that, that doesn't go anywhere. So right at the top of the box, the cost of the project is reasonable because each of the following conditions is met and the applicant's financial condition will sustain any finan uh, financial burden likely to result from completion of the project. Um, right here today, we can't meet that criteria. Next slide. Project is needed more than ever. Um, the cost now with the inflation that all of us um, uh, are experiencing, um, you know, go to the grocery store, um, even shopping for one or two is uh, an eye opener. Um, uh, the inflation on building costs, uh, astronomical. We have thought in the past of citing uh, the facility in Burlington. Um, I'm not, I don't think we have the uh, site coverage um, uh, capacity to take on uh, uh, this unit, but even if we did, uh, it would take uh, much longer and the construction uh, would be even more expensive. And this is just reiterating uh, the uh, annual loss with the current uh, set of measures. Next slide. So we can't uh, responsibly carry forward the project uh, at this time, given the costs and our financial status. Um, as I've said several times, we've pulled this out. Uh, you appropriately wanted this update, that's fine. We're going through this with every single one of our proposed capital projects. So go back to the uh, 22 budget we put in and run the list of things that were in there. Um, we have the, the team really looking at each one of those. And if it doesn't meet a significant patient need and have uh, a margin until we get back to where we need to be financially, um, uh, it's gonna be um, uh, 
probably irresponsible uh, to to propose those projects. At the same time, we made a commitment. Uh, I feel like when we make a commitment, I personally make a commitment, and uh, I pride myself on uh, doing what I say uh, and keeping my commitments. So um, we committed, uh, and you gave us a budget order to um, invest $21 million, uh, uh, and this was in 2018, to improve inpatient psychiatric care for Vermonters. Yeah, paraphrasing a bit, but it's 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 got those elements, and um, uh, we are we've used uh, Eve. Correct me if I'm wrong. Two point three million, and we obviously can account that down to the nickels and dimes of that twenty one million. So at this point, nothing would make uh, us happier than to be in a position where we could take the rest of that money and move forward with this project. Um, there are three absolute prerequisites in our mind um, that Health Network and Central Vermont have to be on a firmer footing. I mean, we have to see those lines going up, and we're not writing any checks until we see that EBITDA margin that creating cash back into the um, uh, into the organization, because uh, to do otherwise puts at jeopardy all the services that we do uh, that Vermonters and folks from Northern New York depend upon us for. There needs to be uh, um, a, a capital partner. Way back in 2018, with the financial strength that we had, very moderate uh, metrics actually between those two sustainability lines, not even at the top one, we had several hundred million dollars more capital that we were in line to generate that could be used to reinvest. And that's exactly the way that we've reinvested in the Miller Building, in Epic, you know, both approximately $200 million projects. And we did that without a rate increase specific to those projects. And that's how this works. When you follow the metrics and you have a stable financial uh, financial platform. So at this point, um, we couldn't possibly uh, uh, generate the capital to cover all of those costs. Um, and we must have the rates, but again, that's something that we could continue to work on. Um, uh, it will take a lot of work and legislative work, uh, good work, but uh, unless we really can uh, um, afford the project and run that glide path, um, uh, it's probably not work that we need to do uh, at this point. You all gave us the budget order. If there's another way that you want to use that 18 point whatever million that's that's left, uh, we stand to improve inpatient psych care. We stand uh, ready to um, uh, invest that as you see fit. Uh, this is how we would see using it uh, uh, for that uh, project. Um, we left you 33 minutes uh, for questions. Usually when I uh, in my past took oral board exams. I tried to get right up to 14 seconds before the exam time was done so that they couldn't ask me any more questions. But, you know, we're giving you 33 minutes. There you go. Thank you, John. Uh, let's look at the uh, cash flow analysis that you did in the, uh, I guess it was 4.5 million in existing loss for your psychiatric uh, uh, use at uh, Central Vermont, with an uh, a delta of another 25.2 million. Um, help us understand uh, that number for that 25.2. You had on a slide that you believed um, there was a good chance to get. Um, cost-based reimbursement from uh, Medicaid. So the 25.2, is that based on that cost-based reimbursement or is that based on if you didn't get it? Go ahead, Eve, you're on mute, but you go ahead. Thanks, Chair Mullen. Um, it's based on current reimbursement. And, you know, when uh, I'll just say, 
um, at least from, uh, and this is not throwing stones in any way, because I, I, everybody's <laughs> willing to work on this, but planning and getting a project of this size going down the path requires that um, if there are risks, they are risks that we can take and that we can cover. Okay, and so if we got two years into this and we're building it, or even if we're opening the doors and you know that still isn't there, a financially solvent organization could roll with it. You know, even if it was just half of that for a year or two to get those reimbursements up, we're not at that point. And you know, a lot of my job is identifying risks and taking the ones that are reasonable and mitigating some and not taking others. And so that's uh, that's how I would put uh, put it into that. It's not that we couldn't get there. It's that that's a risk on a project that is uh, essentially um, uh, we don't meet the criteria to put a CON in right now. How many additional dollars would the cost base reimbursement from Medicaid um, net you? Chair Mullen, I don't, sorry about my clock. I don't have that number handy right now, um, but we could get that for you. Um, Just uh, look back at history, and I feel like uh, we're in a similar place to where we were when Rutland was considering um, doing inpatients like beds, and they made it very, very clear that they could only do them if reimbursement was such that uh, they didn't lose money. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think that your request is uh, unreasonable. You, you can't lose additional money. So it's a reasonable request, and I'm just trying to figure out what it takes to make that project viable so that it could happen. Well, again, it's it's those three criteria. If it would be a project that uh, UBM Health Network would take forward, we would have to have the financial strength to deal with um, a lot more than the $18 million of capital costs that um, uh, we have um, and be able to absorb um, uh, whatever the uh, margin is. And I'm sorry, I'm from the, the show me state that um, for a project this size and the track record of how we've uh, not taken care of people with mental illness until uh, one of my colleagues says, why don't you just tell them the money has to be in escrow before we would go forward? I wouldn't quite go that far, but, um, uh, you know, the... The answer is uh, in the case mix, uh, payer mix, and I don't know what the payer mix is on that uh, service uh, right uh, offhand. But, um, you know, say there was, um, it, it covered uh, all but uh, eight or nine million, and the UVM Health Network is already underwater 13 million uh, for our. Um, uh, our, uh, our units currently, it's still something that we can't absorb at this point. John, I think we hear you loud and clear that you need to be on better financial footing. I'm trying to get to the, uh, to the uh, numbers at hand for the specific project. Um, for the four and a half million that you're losing now, are you being reimbursed differently than your peer hospitals? No, uh, well, I don't. I don't know. I'm. I'm assuming that um, uh, for Medicare and Medicaid, no. For the commercial, um, you know, each hospital negotiates its own uh, commercial reimbursement. So, and I, I'm not allowed to know that figure. But for Medicare and Medicaid, everybody should be. I'm assuming uh, the the same. Okay. So. So, you know, just to excuse me, Chair Mullen, just a, a comment that, um, and we're more than happy, you ask the questions, we'll get you the answer, but what we were prepared for today is an update and not the deep dive that, 
you know, if we really were um, testifying about the certificate of need itself. So we can get, I'm sure Eve can have you that information. Sorry, Eve, by the end of the week, um, if that's what you want, um, uh, we're happy to do that. But we were prepared today for an update, not really the the whole enchilada that comes when you're, you're talking about the CON uh, application. Well, clearly we need the information so that we fully understand what uh, what's at uh, hand here. Um, you made the statement that you're more than willing to uh, make sure that the $21 million gets invested in inpatient psych bed. Um, and again, I'll look at something I'm familiar with, which is Rutland, where they rehabbed an existing floor. You have um, some space, I believe, at Shep, Shep North, I think. I could be wrong there. Um, have you thought at all about investing those dollars there in a rehab into that space? What, um, so with the um, volumes that have come to the academic medical center that um, uh, haven't much been the consequence of the pandemic, some, but not much. Most from uh, population growth, aging, and the fact that services in the smaller hospitals are uh, declining uh, before our eyes. Um, there are rough estimates that um, were many beds short, actual physical beds short at this point, uh, on that campus, um, uh, and I'm talking like several floors short, um, and that um, right now, one of the capital projects we're looking at is a neonatal intensive care unit, incredibly needed. One we have is very undersized, and we can't find a place to put that on the campus going along with what I just said about looking at the capital costs for every single one of, uh, of our projects. So the likelihood that we would be able to do what Rutland did, and I actually was on Tom's board when we started talking about this. Um, so I, I know at least the beginnings, I wasn't there when it, it came to fruition. Um, uh, the um, uh, We don't have the situation because we don't have a space. We have uh, acute patients um, uh, everywhere. And remember what happened to our capacity when the rehab at Fannie went down and we had moved those patients over. And we've come back to you all with uh, a request to allow us to not close beds, which uh, you know was part of the Miller Building CON that we would. And so um, there's a master facility planning process that's going on at the Academic Medical Center now and several other of our facilities. Um, uh, and um, uh, there, I'm just telling you that there's no space for that right now. It would be new space. Okay, so. Um should I just work with Eve to get those numbers over the next couple of weeks? Yeah, I think, um, um, you know, uh, uh, staff to staff, uh, Susan, however your staff reaches out to get those sort of financial metrics, um, uh, you know, we can uh, we can do that. Eve and uh, Rick Vincent shop, Mark Stanislaus, we can we can get you whatever numbers you want. And Eve, I think it really breaks down around the, the service mix or the payer mix assumptions that we have. If another hospital were to step forward and say, um, we think we, we have room for uh, inpatient psych beds at our facility, would you be willing to give them the balance of the 21 million? Yeah, it's at, it's at your discretion. It's a budget order. And uh, you know, um, I take the legal aspects of the regulatory environment uh, pretty nice. I'm sure you could find me for a yellow or an orange jumpsuit if uh, if we didn't. Well, we don't want to see you in any jumpsuits. So uh, no. <laughs> that's not an option. The option okay. is to Thank figure you. out how to get 
how to get this project done. That's what I'm focused on. I, you know, Chair Mullen, I could not agree with you more. I'm not even going to tell you the emotional struggles I've had to get to the point where um, I've been able to even get these words out of my mouth. You know, this is a project you know how much, uh, going back to 2018 and 2019, I wanted to get this done, uh, including a lot of the people around me at this fine organization looking at me like I was nuts um, uh, and that it was uh, just uh, in the too hard to do box. But I really, really, really want to do this and I would love to see it got, get done uh, at some point. Um, uh, and, you know, if another organization could really meet the need and, and it does have to be a hospital because of the IMD thing. I mean, that's the other thing that we keep dancing around um, uh, that uh, was, a, a, again, a big driver for us and for me to keep going um, it, to really get those reimbursements. we got to hook it to a hospital. The Brattleboro Retreat is just suffering mightily because of not having that. So, um, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm sure with Huebner on that board, they're probably exploring all options, but maybe they should be talking about uh, an affiliation with a hospital, but that's a whole other topic. <laughs> um, we, won't, we won't try to solve all the problems of the world today. Yeah. So I'm, I'll open up the uh, board questions and start with uh, board member Pelham. Tom? Well, thank you, um, Mr. Brumstead and team. Um, this is a uh, helpful update as a start because all you know these numbers are kind of uh, in intermingled and intertangled you know and uh, and so just to see it in such a short period on a few slides it's not totally comprehensible but to me um, so but one point I'd like to go back to is that you mentioned at the beginning of your discussion that uh, the loss of the um, psychiatric beds in Waterbury because of Irene. Um, and that, uh, you know, as you know, was a facility that had 150 beds. Um, and as a matter of public policy, um, uh, during the 90s, it was downsized to 50 beds, 52, I think, actually, um, with uh, and then pushing the money back out to the designated agencies and kind of making that kind of shift in policy and, and programming. And so um, when Irene came along, those 50 beds were um, taken out of service. They just weren't, weren't recoverable. And so my simple logic says that here is the state of Vermont. Um, they had a facility that they were paying for, both capital and operating, those, you know, those 50 beds. A natural disaster wiped them out. They rebuilt 25 of them up in the Berlin facility, which are totally state funded, both capital and operating. And so why are the next 25 um, being treated differently? Um, it might be a, a, you know, a kind of a, you know, <clears throat> unless, I, unless I'm missing something. I mean, part of that, I was part of the history. More recently, I wasn't part of the history. But I, I don't see why um, why the state. One might argue that the state should basically cover the cost of replacing those uh, 25 beds um, because it was a natural disaster that took them out, and uh, shifting that cost onto ratepayers um, would just be another avenue of the cost shift, as opposed for the state uh, taking a reasonable level of responsibility for building the 25 beds that they lost, that they have, that they haven't re replaced. Is that, am I missing something there in that line of line of logic or? or um, the only thing you're missing is um, uh, uh, how impatient I am. You're absolutely ironclad in your logic that at some point, the state of Vermont should absolutely uh, invest and increase back up to the appropriate complement of inpatient, adult inpatient psychiatric beds. And we can talk about the pediatric adolescent piece too, but um, uh, waiting for that to happen 
when you have your emergency medicine physicians coming to you and telling you that we're not treating patients appropriately because of what's happening is how you get impatient. And so we, it's not, Mr. Pelham, that we haven't had those conversations. I've had it with several governors. Uh, I had a relatively heated conversation with the governor who made the decision to rebuild half of the beds. Um, uh, and, um, you know, uh, but, you know, that was the genesis of us jumping on this um, and trying to, to get this forward. We've been uh, overcome by uh, events uh, and we can't do it right now. But your logic is solid. Uh, this, this, um, not worth that much. I mean, I, I thought it was solid, but, uh, it's, uh, you know, it, it just, it just seems unfair. I mean, it, it's just not, it's, it's, um, but I, I, I thought that it might not be happening because I, I was missing something in the interim years, but, um, but other than that, I think um, I'll work through um, Susan just to kind of clear up from my notes. You know, uh, like I like you know I'm look, looking at the um, the hundred hundred million dollars in capital expense for the IPP beds um, and the fifty seven million dollars for the ED, and I'm just not quite sure how to break that down on a per bed basis and allocate it and, and then follow it through the cash flows. But um, I, my questions aren't yet clear enough for me to ask. So um, I, I will get them back to you uh, via Susan. Thank you. We'll, we'll certainly uh, answer those. Tom, you're, you and I are starting to think alike, and that's a, a bad thing because uh, I was looking at that hundred million, dividing it out by the 40 and coming up with uh, two and a Four half million. Uh, yeah. $4 million a bed. <laughs> I did the math too. <laughs> My little calculator right here. And I'm going $4 million a bed. And the, 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 no, uh, uh, no, wait a minute. Two and a half. Two and a half. Two, two and a half. And, and, you know, the, uh, there's a metric floating around out there that psych beds only cost a million dollars a bed. Not when you make them, uh, uh, med surge capable and not when you build them in, 22 going forward. I mean, it, you wouldn't believe if you if you look at the spreadsheets what just the inflation uh, costs on the construction have done. In, uh, we, in we do believe it. We're months. hearing from every CON in the state what what the price changes have been in their project. So we believe it. It's uh, unfortunate, but we definitely believe it, and it's a reality. So I'll next turn to um, Dr. Holmes, Jessica. Well, thank you. Um, and thank you for the presentation. I, I recognize this is not an easy presentation to make or a decision to come to. Um, and I also recognize all the incredible work that's been done on this project in the last few years and um, all the efforts that were made. Thank you. And I also recognize the financial situation that you're in, Dr. Bromstead. Um, and, I, and to be honest with you, I understand completely the decision to pull the plug at this point in time, um, given the financial pressures that you're under. So uh, I, I guess, you know, my brain is already trying to problem solve and, and it's not like I can problem solve this some way that you all haven't, right? <laughs> because I'm sure that you've looked under every rock and done everything that you possibly can. Um, along, you know, my colleague there, Tom Pelham's lines, I mean, I do wonder about conversations with the state on you know contributions to the investment costs of building you know i had the same sort of reaction to those 25 beds um and uh, obviously the medicaid reimbursement is going to have to be critical to any you know eventually moving forward on that as well as medicare and i don't know whether there's some uh stipulations or something that we might be thinking about in the next federal agreement that would help along those lines um so i just would plant that seed but I'm also wondering, you know, as I was thinking about this, there's there are a lot of cost savings that if this um, unit were put into place that other hospitals would experience in terms of, you know, lower costs for their borders, 
pa- you know, patients that are in their uh, med surge, potentially in their med surge patients that really just need to be transferred, um, that could be replaced by a more acute patient that would probably have a higher reimbursement. I mean, I'm just imagining other hospitals would benefit clearly from the building of this, not only financially, but clearly for their patients. I mean, we are, there's a clear public need in my mind for this. This is really going to, it's only one step, but obviously would make a huge difference in the mental health crisis that we are facing. And it seems to me that could we initiate some conversations, you know, more broadly with the state, with the legislature, with other hospitals to, to build you know, a contribution pot to help make this happen, I guess is what I'm wondering. Are there other hospitals that might be willing to contribute? Are there donors out there? You know, where can we find the the financial resources to make this happen? I recognize it cannot all come from the UVM Health Network, Dr. Bromstead, given the situation that you're under. But I guess I'm just wondering, are there other resources out there? So I just will throw that out there. You may not be able to answer that. But. Well, the, I can't answer it uh, other than uh, to comment and give opinion. We have, um, as with any <clears throat> capital project, we do have folks from our philanthropy development team that have met with Eve and others, and um, but really in the starting blocks. They haven't gone out to seek donors or anything like that. And it gets really, really complicated if um, uh, you have an asset that would be on the license and owned by Centre Vermont, and you have other not-for-profit organizations contributing to that. I mean, I'm not even going to play a lawyer here, but, you know, I'm thinking joint ventures and, you know, um, how do you, you do that? Um, uh, so it gets really, really complicated. I mean, the most straightforward way to um, finance this, uh, an asset of this size in our environment is go back to 2012 through 18 and look at the metrics of the academic medical center and the UVM health network and that revenue and expense and service mix all those run rates added together is how you do these size of capital investments and eat um, uh, operating losses and so that's one way the other way is with um, state or federal money um, uh, and, um, you know, there's a bucket of federal money, uh, around, I didn't get really specific, but I did make several pitches that fixing the mental health system in Vermont would be a very reasonable piece of the, uh, piece of the infrastructure that we could make once in a lifetime investment in and get back on the right track, Mr. Pelham, to your, your point. But I see those are the, those are really the two pathways. There isn't another healthcare organization that has the scale or scope to be able to make this size investment. Um, uh, and um, so that's that's how it's worked for my whole professional life here until the, the last, uh, last four and a half, five years. That's, I mean, again, that's how we did the Miller building and how we've got Epic now for a million people uh, in our catchment area. And we, you, you do that without a specific uh, rate increase when your financial metrics are all lined up. Have you done the, the math on what the commercial rate requests would be with and without this inpatient unit for your next budget and your next five budgets, say um, the next three budgets? I don't believe so. That would be a, a planning question, Eve, if you looked at it from that lens. Yeah, mute. Oh, we still can't hear you. Me. So sorry, everybody. Um, so um, nothing, nothing that I could share at this time. It was playing around, but um, but you know that's that's something we could model. Like we cert- talk, talk to yeah, that. I mean, yeah. we certainly can parse that out of the other ways we look at how we. I mean, we solve for the. Uh, the required commercial rate increase on the Vermont side. We could just pull that that piece out and look at it. 
Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Um, I guess my last question is, I know you're reevaluating all your capital projects and um, understandably so. I'm wondering how you prioritize those projects. Specifically, how do you balance the financial margin potential of a capital project against the population health value of a potential project? And, you know, because clearly this has very, very high population health value and low financial margin value, right? So I guess my question is, as you're going through your capital projects, how do you weigh that? And how do you, how does that calculus change if you're living in a fee-for-service world versus if you're living in a global payment, value-based payment world? So I'm starting, you know, I'm wondering how you're making those calculations now, and are you making them assuming that you're in a fee-for-service world, or are you making them assuming there's going to be a movement towards a global payment where there's going to be more accountability for population health. And does that change how you evaluate those projects? If my question makes sense. Yeah. To you. yeah. I mean, and it is incredibly uh, multifactorial and re requires diversity of opinion uh, and thought. And we have all sorts of factors that uh, we throw into the mix, um, uh, including all of those. And, as an organization, we are always looking to the value-based world. And again, that makes this really difficult, but was a rationale for the uh, putting several million dollars into the primary care mental health integration. Um, right now, where we stand, I would say the uh, most imp important factors are um, need of a patient population, um, uh, margin, um, uh, at least covering costs. Um, and um, third, which is really important, if we don't do it, what happens? And, you know, if we, if we don't do this, we're in a position that we've been in for a number of years, it's painful. We've made some accommodations. There uh, are other things that uh, would just give you a, a, a for instance, um, uh, we don't, uh, our lease runs out in the end of 2026 for the Fannie Allen campus in Colchester. Anything that's there is gonna need a new home. So, you know, that sort of weighs in pretty heavy in our decision making for what's right in front of our nose. Um, um, the other thing that's increasingly uh, is the impact on uh, disadvantaged populations. Um, you know, uh, the uh, health equity equation, which embarrassingly over past decades hasn't been it's been known about and understood, but hasn't been at the top of the list as determinants, is now very close to the top of our list, which again, makes this project going into um, uh, a, a phase of indefinite hold incredibly painful for us. I mean, and this is just not me, this is our whole management team feels this way, so. Thank you. That's that's it for me, Chair Mullen. Thanks. Um, board member Lunch, Robin. Thank you. Um, well, there are some benefits to going last because most of my questions have been already asked. Um, I did have some questions related to the assumptions, but I think it will make sense for me to also send those to Susan so that we just send you a package related to that. Um, I was just noting that, as you just indicated, Dr. Bremstead, it sounds like what you are saying is that you're putting the project on indefinite hold. I haven't seen a request for relief from the budget order. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, let me be really clear um, uh, that... Um, it's a budget order. From my perspective, the ball's in your court 
that either sits there and simmers until hopefully someday when we can resurrect this this project or if you find a better use for that, and I'm sure that there's some legalistic way that um, uh, Mr. Barber uh, to uh, Mr. Miller, you know, paper goes back and forth and, you know, we um, uh, comply with your order. So our ability to go forward right now is what's on hold, not the not that commitment. If, if that, whatever it is, 18 and a half million um, you find a use to uh, improve inpatient psychiatric care. That's our commitment. Um, and again, I'm sure that there's legal ways that that request flows to us and then we comply with that request. But does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Well, it, it doesn't legally make sense to me, um, but I haven't talked to our legal team about it because I think actually as typically if there's a, an inability to apply with the order, there would be a request for relief or to change the order from the regulated entity to the regulator. We don't, we're not usually in the habit of sua sponte changing our orders without a request, but I'll talk to our legal team um, just so that I can see what they have to say about it. I'm not sure that the ball is in our court, um, but okay. I'm happy to talk to our team. Okay. Well, and, and um, I have had some conversations with Eric Miller about this, but not with this degree of specificity. So we certainly can work that out. But I want it very clear that uh, we keep our commitments. And if there's uh, um, some other good use of these dollars um, um, other than having that commitment live on until we can uh, resurrect this, um, uh, we'll comply. Thank you. Uh, that was my only follow up. Um, everything else I was interested in has been asked. So, Dr. Brumstead, um, you know, I still want to try to figure out a way to uh, make this happen. So, I, I will um, have the staff work with uh, your staff to try to uh, um, figure out the numbers more. Um, one of the things that I was just looking at that uh, um, was the HMA Burns analysis that uh, was conducted on behalf of the board. And surprisingly, uh, mental health in that analysis showed that Medicaid was actually the best payer and were the, was the only payer that was paying at uh, cost currently. Um, and it looks like there's a real shortfall in commercial and an even bigger shortfall in uh, Medicare reimbursement. So these are all the things that uh, we can work out with the staff and try to uh, get all the facts in front of us. Um, you know, I, I also, uh, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to rub salt in the wounds, but there probably would have to be a discussion about whether or not uh, there was any uh, um, interest earned on the money as it sat for the three years and or four years, whatever. But that, that's, that's not what's important here. What's important here is getting inpatient psych beds. And I, I hope that you haven't thrown in the towel and that you're willing to still work towards that goal. Um, um, globally, uh, yes, uh, always willing to um, try and figure out ways to meet needs uh, for Vermonters and people in Northern New York. Um, you know, the, the presentation speaks for itself where we're at right now with this and all of our other capital projects, um, you know, uh, so, but always willing to talk uh, and uh, bring our expertise um, uh, if that's uh, asked for. Sometimes things always look the darkest before there's light, so I'm still hopeful. Thank you. So with that, uh, I'll open it up for uh, public comment. Is there anyone who wishes to offer public comment at this time? Is there anyone who wishes to offer public comment at this time? Hearing and seeing none. Um, we will be in touch and uh, we appreciate your candid 
update and your honesty. And um, let's see if we all can work together to try to find a way to uh, get this done. Thank you. Thank you all for your time. Much appreciated. Have a good afternoon. Thanks. Susan, I know that uh, on the agenda is a discussion for um, the Department of Mental Health. Obviously, there's a lot of questions that are raised by this discussion that would be helpful to, uh, to have, but I don't think it's fruitful for us to have a discussion amongst ourselves. And I really think it's uh, imperative that we get um, a firm date for the commissioner to come in and to have the discussion and so that there can be a back and forth. But other board members, what are your thoughts? That I just had some questions. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Tom. I was just saying that that makes sense to me. We got that memo, well, late last night, and uh, it just seems some time, you know, it'd be better to have some time to let it set in and to have the folks here to, you know, engage in a discussion about it. Yeah, and I'm fine with that, but I think that, like, uh, what I would hope the discussion would, I would hope the discussion would be a little bit broader than the information we had around, we received around the wait times in EDs, which is obviously a very important component. But um, I was hoping that they could talk about inpatient psych in the context of their overall mental health plan and mental health needs, uh, the impact of um, the global commitment renewal on, um, on, for example, the IMD rules and uh, and those sorts of things, because that there is an intertwining there. And I know I know we're not final final on the on the next global commitment, but I'm just having that context. I think could be helpful. Um, so I was so I just wanted to put that out there so that there's maybe a little more context for when they come in. And Mr. Chair, can I just respond to certainly? Um, I will. I will follow up. I don't know if they're going to be the people to answer those, all of those questions. So I will. Um, I well, we should try to get all the people that are necessary yeah. to answer those questions in the room at the same time mm -hmm. and have a panel discussion. I will put out the invitation. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm fine with that. I agree. I mean, I, to me, I'm really interested in understanding, uh, you know, we heard on the wait times, you know, uh, project, we heard a lot about psych services and waits for psych services all along the care continuum. To Dr. Bromstead's point, there's a log jam and there's multiple, you know, places where there's a log jam, whether it's counseling services, crisis beds, inpatient beds, EDs, it's all along the that um, spectrum there. So I really want to understand more from the Department of Mental Health, where they see the biggest issues, um, you know, their understanding of capacity needs, their understanding of the log jam. Um, there was some interesting information in the what they sent us last night about new value-based payment models for the DAs and funding changes for the DAs. So I'd like to learn more about that. Um, there was some conversation, uh, there was some a point in there about funding uh, for nursing supports at the Brattleboro retreat, but that ended in April. So what's happening after that? I mean, we we are in a mental health crisis, and I and I, I guess I want to understand more broadly beyond just the ED what is what's happening and and what's the solution. And I I want to say in part, you know, I've been on this board for many years, and we've been in a mental health crisis for many years, and it seems growing. There was a New York Times article about youth mental health crisis. Uh, nationwide, and I just want to, you know, get a better sense of what we're going to be doing uh, as a state to try and address these issues. And I'm, um, and now, you know, this is now the news today is is more concerning. There's, you know, there was some path forward that we saw, and now this looks like it's at least temporarily off the table. So what are we going to do about it? And what are some uh, new paths to explore, or new funding sources to entertain or seek? I don't know, but. It's deeply troubling the, the state that we're in. And I guess I want to hear about what, you know, those who are thinking about this on a daily basis, you know, what they see as paths forward. Okay. So at this point, um, I don't think that we have another agenda item. So is there any old business to come before the board?
Is there any new business to come before the board? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay. Have a great rest of the day and stay positive and sooner or later we'll figure out this path. <laughs>